Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, not much to tell you about my personal life. Let's just dive into this week's show. Uh, My guest this week is the author, journalist, radio host, editor, we'll say raconteur, etc., Kurt Anderson. Um, I've been hoping to record with Kurt for a long time, so I'm awfully glad we got the opportunity. Kurt has a new book out from Penguin Random House called Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, A Recent History, and it's going to infuriate and maybe inspire you. Now, I I pitched Kurt on doing the podcast early in 2020 when I first heard about Evil Geniuses, and I had just started his previous book, Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, in March to prep for this conversation. Um, Then the pandemic hit, and it pushed us all into quarantine mode, and a lot of the behavior that Kurt chronicles the roots of in his 500-year dive into America's strangeness in fantasy land um, sort of all came to the fore. Uh, That book came out in 2017, and it's a remarkable exploration of American history from its its Protestant roots onwards. And it really helps us understand the, the macro picture of how we got to the age of Trump. So... Like Fantasyland, Evil Geniuses, which comes out today, uh, August 11th, 2020, for you time travelers out there, um, this one's a history that covers just the last 50 years or so, right up through this May, in fact. See, Kurt explores the, the game plan that rich conservatives develop to protect big business in America uh, through legislation, deregulation, uh, stacking, or infiltrating, depending on, on how you want to take it, uh, the judiciary. Um, and he, he produces the, the memos and documents that illustrate the whole concerted effort to do this. And, and he shows how and, and why income inequality began what seems like a real death spiral about five decades ago. It's not a conspiratorial speculative book, which is a, a concept we sort of talk about in the conversation, but one that shows you There are dots to connect, and when you do that, you start to understand how we ended up where we have. I mean, beyond the the governmental assault and and the decline of organized labor that was part of that, he also chronicles the cultural changes in America over that that span, Um, the the, the whole cultural stasis and nostalgia that, that hits from the 80s onwards, the way that profit over everything is a sort of natural response, if a perverted one, uh, to the 60s, if it feels good, do it mentality. And and how when you you wed that to the the technological leaps we've made, it's, well, it's, it's less of a surprise when we look at how the Internet's initial promise of freedom kind of got co-opted into a, a, well, a series of walled gardens that are basically meant to turn us all into to advertising fodder. Now, Kurt also gets into the the way the anti-science, anti-expert, hyper-individualist uh, movements took off and were promoted uh, by the same sort of reactionary force and, and how they benefit that ruling class, which works just fine for them until there's a, a global pandemic that requires trust in science and a, a sense of community obligation, at which point you know, we end up where we are. Now, for all that, Evil Geniuses isn't out to, to paint an irreversibly bleak picture. Kurt contends that the very 
engineered nature of the the past 50 years means it can be engineered away from that. And we, we talk about that more in the conversation. Suffice to say, Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America is an important book. And Kurt's prose and, and command of the subject matter make it a pretty compelling one, too. And I should point out, this isn't all just a heavy uh, treatise of, of history and, and reactionary forces. There are some humorous moments in it, uh, most of which revolve around Kurt's personal history and, and some anecdotes he includes, like the time he pissed off financier Henry Kravis during his tenure as editor of New York Magazine. Now, um, as caveats go, not a lot. Audio was good, uh, as I was hoping, from a guy who hosted Studio 360 on, on public radio for 20 years. Um, also, I'm not sure if this is the longest interview Kurt has ever done where Spy Magazine never comes up, but Spy Magazine never comes up. Uh, maybe if we sit down to talk again, that'll that'll happen. Anyway, here's Kurt's bio from the book. There's a more comprehensive one at his site. Kurt Anderson is the best-selling author of the novels Heyday, Turn of the Century, and True Believers. He contributes to Vanity Fair and the New York Times and was a host and co-creator of Studio 360, the Peabody, Peabody award-winning public radio show and podcast. He also writes for television, film, and stage. Anderson co-founded Spy Magazine, served as editor-in-chief of New York, and was a cultural columnist and critic for Time and The New Yorker. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College, where he was an editor of the Harvard Lampoon. He lives in Brooklyn. And his new book is Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Kurt Anderson. I guess, as an opening sort of question, um, more of a comment than a question. I'm just kidding. Uh, mm -hmm. You you finished your previous book about America's insane nature before Trump got elected, and you finished this one largely before a worldwide pandemic <sighs> occurred, where the U.S. is leading in deaths and and stupidity. Do you do you feel cursed at all? Do you think maybe go back to fiction or or is you know do you feel any any responsibility for all? This? Well, you know it's funny. I I I I do not feel as though I'm a prophet uh, who 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 brings uh, misery to the world by what I choose to write. However, it is it has, uh, you're not the first person to mention that. My editor, in fact, when I turned Evil Geniuses in uh, at the beginning of February. Um, with the notation on the table of contents, conclusion TK. And of course, <laughs> not everybody knows what TK means, but it means it's a writerese, journalese thing for, I'll figure out the conclusion and write it. Well, a month later, uh, I, I, it, it was delivered unto me. Um, and uh, yeah, it is It is a little weird. I mean, uh, as, you, as you, exactly as you suggest, with Fantasyland, you know, I've been working on it for years really and thinking about it for years and working on it since 2014 and then as i'm finishing it here comes donald trump about to get the nomination and uh, becoming the poster boy so yeah it's it is it's a little strange i could imagine now how much uh, and this the book has been sort of positioned as a companion to fantasy land evil geniuses but uh -huh. how much did fantasy land feed into this and and how much did this one sort of diverge from what you, did you conclude anything from this that you know diverges from where you you your research is for fantasy land? Not really diverges, but it definitely was. I mean, sequel is not exactly right, but it is a companion volume. They are a, 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 a two volume history of how we've how we went into the ditch the last fifty years in my telling. Um, and and what I realized when I was after I finished fantasy land and and when I started to talk to people about it before it even came out. I realized, well, this is really just half the story. This is this is how this what again in my telling what was in the American bloodstream for hundreds of years from the beginning. This this uh, predisposition to believe in fantastical non realities as if they were reality and delusions and magical thinking and all the rest and all mixed up in entertainment. But that that was a kind of organic chronic condition that became acute uh, in the last few decades and years. And, and I realized that the, the economic, political, technological part of it 
of, of how we have gotten into a bad place in the United States the last few decades. What is the other half of that story? Um, both of them, the, the political right has a lot to account for in both instances. But, but whereas Fantasyland was kind of nobody's fault in a certain way and everybody's fault, uh, the, the problems I, I, I point to there. In the case of Evil Geniuses, I realized, and, and more than I really realized before I did the couple of years of research, uh, was really a, 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 it was a deliberate effort. It was, it was a coordinated effort with, with a vision and with, with, with battle plans and with coordination. And to an extent, I never realized. So in, in a certain way, yes, there are companions, but a lot of Fantasyland was, or a good part of Fantasyland was about how the, the uh, Americans falling for all kinds of preposterous conspiracy theories the last 50 years, more and more and more. Was it was it part of the problem of fantasy land that I was reckoning with and talking about? Well, in the case of Evil Geniuses, I, I'm saying, well, yeah, I, I, I'm not disavowing that, but well, some of them. Yeah. But but <laughs> yeah. the, my 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 unwillingness or 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 disinclination to believe in conspiracy theories I, I, became kind of a problem. I think I think it led me and other reasonable people and rational people not to see um, the kind of conspiracy in plain sight that that the that the right and that the economic right in particular uh, what had what was doing in plain sight mostly in the 70s and 80s and 90s yeah that's been a um, oh <laughs> I probably should have told you this from the outset um, my job involves lobbying for yes. a weird, yes. weird I, sector of the pharmaceutical industry I so I, I may have Okay. When, when you when you reached out to me in the first place, I saw that. I thought that'll be interesting. And when he finds the pharmaceutical industry uh, and lobbyists, but my guy, um, my guys are not the bad guys. Okay. My guys are just the contract manufacturers for the drug companies. Uh -huh. So all they do is physically make the drugs, Fine. which is outsourcing, but generally not offshoring. Fine. Most of my guys are domestic, so it's not like it's so they just make they just make, pill, make the pills and medicines. Right, like the way your printer makes the book for Great. the publisher. So then okay, I, absol I so absolve you. Yeah, I have nothing to do with pricing. I don't have anything to do with weird clinical trials. I can sleep at night. Good. But that said, I've had to spend time on the Hill. Yeah. And there are many aspects of your book that resonated with me in, okay. in lots of ways. But there's also the the um, the situation I had to deal with early on. I attributed everything to sinister causes because of weird stuff that impacted my little sector. And I came to realize certain things were either negligence or incompetence mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. sinister goals. And so I, that's what reading your book, I, I had that moment of, yeah, I could see the things that are actually coordinated and terrible. And then there's just the ancillary for sure. or even the resulting government for has sure. been stripped down so far they can't even enforce X, for Y, sure. and Z and you end up with even worse results. But was there a degree to which you had a – a fear of of drawing too many connections. A, a, a fear of, I guess, looking or sounding paranoid. Well, I'm, I'm not a fear of. I mean, and I think I was pretty careful to say again and again and again. Listen, I'm not saying this is a conspiracy, and and I don't believe in conspiracies. And here's why. And they are, as you say, uh, uh, the, most of them aren't true because the competence required of the conspirators is beyond human possibility. And and. But I, I think, I think again, certainly I had, and I think much of the media have, and 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 Democrats and centrists and everybody else, lots of people have erred too much in the opposite direction of not putting, not connecting the dots, and 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 mm -hmm. and beyond the connecting the dots, I'm not saying that you know five guys in a in a dark room uh, pulling the strings and had their plan in 1971 and pulled it off, although more than I ever thought it, <laughs> that that being true <laughs> is true. But more, all of the you know we that we see this happened with with healthcare, or this happened with lobbying, or this happened with pensions, or this happened with the tax cut and regulation, and on and on and on. And I had, I mean, I had a sense of this as I write about in the book. You know, starting I don't know at the turn of the century, really, uh, that like wait, this we 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 we've we abandoned our good old new deal all boats rise idea of of the american social contract but i but i really hadn't to my satisfaction 
put all of the put all of the 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 things together and how did this happen how did this happen how does this happen um and 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 really sort of to my explain to myself uh how this had all happened and and how widespread and how profound it is because it it wasn't like the new deal where you have a depression you have all these programs america changes kaboom it's all th- yeah. these this was so this was as far reaching really as the new deal and it's and i call it the raw deal in its in its right. imposition but 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 it happened in so many ways slowly and gradually and in in kind of invisible uncontroversial bureaucratic ways so so no i you know i i think i i think i maintained my my skepticism of 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 you know paranoid conspiracy and 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 of of uh sort of the just so stories uh, you know of of the dan brown kind that are imposed on on um on reality and i you know i still think qAnon for instance is insane um <laughs> but yeah. but I, I do think that that the unwillingness of me and people like me not to to sort of see the the, the plain truths that are more more uh, of a of a rigging of the system than we we were inclined to think uh, have, have 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 been as I say kind of useful idiots to the to the right. Yeah. I, I've long held that Paul Simon's Boy in the Bubble from the, the mid-80s, the, the song that leads off Graceland, uh-huh. I think captures the 21st century. Yes. Almost every line of that song, including the loose affiliation of millionaires and billionaires. There you go. Everything. Everything in there. It's like, oh, you were predicting everything we were going through in a pop song 25 years ago. Yeah. Okay, that that's yeah. you know the power of, of music. But is there a, a single better illustration of, of the problems you describe in evil geniuses than than the failure we're seeing on the the part of the federal government during this this whole situation. Well, it really was again as you began saying, you know, Donald, you know, I write fantasy and Donald Trump shows up to illustrate it to a T. Similarly, it it, it was kind of amazing to me. Uh, I, I you know spent once again years thinking about it, a couple of years doing research, and a and a year year and a half writing, and and. Uh, and 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 it's it's a you know it's a disparate history and it's lots of things from here and there and this happened then and this happened then here we have in 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 this at this moment in this you know uh in these last several months this all, all, all almost all of the things that i say the right did the evil geniuses did to you know discredit the idea of government discredit the idea of progress um, disbelieve science, um, make uh, short-term profits and sh- stock prices the 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 lodestar in American society, and everything else must come after, a- a- and many more. All of them, all of them, we see in 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 how this administration and and the Republican Senate and the right in general uh, reacted immediately to this. Horrible pandemic. Uh, instead of being a public health crisis and 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 gigantic challenge that we'll we'll have to deal with, uh, they they looked at it as uh oh it's going to tank the stock market. Uh oh, um, profits except for tech companies <laughs> are gonna are gonna take yeah. a hit. Uh oh, we're going to have to have a, a some kind of big social program to get Americans through this hellish economic period. All these things. Which, which, uh, just immediately, it was, it was, if if we needed a, a a kind of real life case study of of how how we've gotten into this terrible place, here it was, uh, the, the sort of ultimate stress test that proves my point and my points. And you see, the reaction to it is twofold: let's cut unemployment benefits and protect employers. From COVID nineteen related suits, exactly, and 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 you precisely. Know. No, the, the the urgent need was to indemnify everybody from uh, from big business from suits. And again, I mean, it's 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 it, it dealing with this was a complicated thing. How do you how do you get the economic economy going again and all that? The rest of the rich world, of course, dealt with it, and you know, in different ways, but. In almost every case, more sensibly and less, and less, less of a of a of a binary, politically fraught way of it's either the economy or public health. Sorry, we can't do both. You know, so 
Yeah, it, it is. It, it is extraordinary to me, and I think it shows in in a kind of with a with a kind of starkness um, um, <laughs> that. <laughs> Uh, the evil part of my evil genius's title is 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 maybe a little hyperbolic, but not so much. Yeah, yeah, you can you can lean on that adjective pretty well in, yeah, in this one. Yeah. Can you talk a little uh, just for the the listeners because I've I've blew through the the PDF uh, proof or the the arc they sent me. Um, the the thesis we'll say you know the the origin for it in terms of 1970 onwards you know yeah. where where the book comes from and what your uh, well what your take is yeah I mean I, I give a very short uh, sort of history just to sort of as a primer for the people who hadn't been as 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 immersed in American history and economics and the rest as I have of how, of how we got here and and in addition to how we got to be a with not before with and after the new deal this this fairer and fairer economy um where where all boats were rising um more or less in sync i mean there were obviously still poor people and rich people and there was still racism that kept black people from earning as much and the rest but all boats were rising if productivity went up so did the median income of everybody and so did so did it was it was, all boats were rising together that we had it it was going pretty well the sixties happened. The other and 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 as in the late sixties, as there seemed, there was a greater and greater skepticism of big business, uh, and 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 suddenly there was an environmental protection agency, and there was a consumer product commission, and 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 the federal government was getting more more and even more than it had since the New Deal into big businesses' business, right? And uh, there was a moment of of freak out among. Uh, CEOs and the the libertarian right, like Milton Friedman and 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 simply rich people, uh, that led them, led groups of them, and 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 who who were affiliated with each other to say, hey, we got to stop this before maybe maybe this you know in 1970 71 maybe this revolution talk is for real and we're going to get expropriated or something. We we got to fight this. We got to we have to organize capitalism as it's never been organized before in this country to create a kind of oligarchic counterattack. And so they did. And, 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 and I had never realized, I mean, I was a kid, but you know, sentient in the seventies, certainly I never, I just didn't know until I did the research that, uh, that what, what we all saw happen in 1980 and the 1980s with the election of Ronald Reagan and so forth and, and, and supply side economics and this, and this, and this shift, uh, right to where market values are everything. I didn't realize that they had spent this decade of, of building institutions, building this counter establishment, changing really, really cleverly, brilliantly working in so many different ways to change the paradigm and change people's minds about what government could or should or couldn't or shouldn't do. And, and, and uh, so that's the thesis that we, that we, and that they rode what was also happening right after the sixties as a result in my telling of the sixties of this, this kind of general cultural plunge into nostalgia and oh the good old days in pop culture and movies and television and music and all kinds of ways. And that, um, was a helped helped the political right turn happen um, because oh let's make it like it was let's make let's go back to Bedford Falls let's let's make it nice like that and uh, like we let's get these government bureaucrats out of everything we don't like big government do we you know and 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 so that worked I mean again they didn't the evil geniuses didn't create that uh, nostalgia mania that took over in the seventies and never stopped but they used it and 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 my uh, another big point of my story as i tell it is that the democrats including young neoliberal democrats like me were like oh, well you know they've got a point and maybe government is too bloated and you know let's be responsible you know let's compromise let's let's look at new ways of thinking maybe unions aren't so good or aren't so important and 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 again i we became their their useful idiots because we just kept moving to the center as the center kept moving right in in economic terms yeah. for for decades uh so that's the basic story and 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 um uh you know it has other threads and details but that's 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 the basic story that that 
And my hope and, and the hopeful part and a, a whole nother set of threads of the book is, is, is technology and, and um, how it looks to me and to all of the authoritative experts in the field that I've read that we are obviously already soon there will not be enough good, well-paying jobs for Americans because AI and, incre and, and continuing automation is, is, is going to do the work is going to do more and more of the work. And, and so what do you do? And, and whether it's, you know, a, a, a universal basic income or, or some other set of, 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 of programs that other, that social democracies have, we're going to need to deal with that. So, so we're at a, we're at a kind of multiple inflection point uh, right now where, where we've had uh, this, this paradigm shift in this, in this remaking of the political economy and the system and the norms for the last 40 years. And now um, w w what's going to happen when, when there are, there simply aren't enough jobs as there already aren't. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's been a fairly slow moving process so far, but, but, but whether it's the elimination of many of the giant and manufacturing um, uh, employment uh, in America, which was yes, of course, partly of offshoring jobs to China and elsewhere, but it was, it's also about, automation and productivity increasing and and things becoming more efficient well that that is accelerating and and yeah. and it's accelerating i think faster than most people realize and uh, so if we have this sort of oligarchic system that has been in place for the last 40 or 45 years um and and then we <laughs> there're going to be fewer and fewer jobs and 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 the same lack of social safety net that we have compared and which is so different and so exceptionally different from the rest of the rich world, we're going to be in a really bad place. So, so, uh, I mean, I think we're already in a fairly bad place and, and, and I really do think we are, it's, 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 it's now or never folks. And, and we have to, uh, look back and see as, as some young people just literally don't realize and some people forget or whatever, this was a much much fairer country economically 45 years ago in by every measure and and that's in in significant measure because the government was allowed to do things like be aggressive about antitrust enforcement and um on and on and on and so we, we you know they they've had their way with us um the evil geniuses and the economic right for a long time and and it's in and, and I'm hopeful that you know there was a, there was a sort of you know 50 years of of the New Deal and 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 the resulting it was all working pretty well, and then there has been nigh on 50 years of of the counter reaction to that and and so if there is such a thing as historical cycles maybe maybe it's time for the uh, for the uh, for the for the next swing of the pendulum and, I, and one one sees evidence of that around I think. Well, I recorded with Benjamin Taylor a couple of days ago, and we talked about his book on Naples, where he has a section on Giovanni Vico. So we, we did get the, the cyclical nature of, of history yes. Um, yes. coming up very okay. recently. But um, you were hoping for a reset after the financial crash, uh, oh, as I recall, also that there was not not to say, again, that your books are either prescient or, you know, yeah. somehow Cassandra-like, yeah. where you're calling it these things and we're ignoring them. But did you see that? Do you see echoes in this moment with what we were looking at as Occupy started to grow and as, to me, the financial crash was particularly insane because it was the nature of finance itself Correct. that was going off the rails, which you address in this book, certainly. Yeah. Uh, that it was no longer about something else, but about finance and economy that couldn't reconcile with itself and started overfeeding and overheating. No, that's exactly right. And, and I, and back then, I, again, I was, I knew what I knew and I'd written because journalists write about things they only half know uh, about the various uh, financial rapacity of that had been going on since the, since the eighties and nineties, uh, both, both before the crash of 2008 and, and during, but I, I really hadn't realized, I mean, I'd seen this word financialization thrown around. I didn't really know what that meant. I knew, 
I live in New, I live in New York City, so I knew Wall Street had gotten bigger and bigger, and people people who worked in the financial industry were getting paid more and more. And I and I had my my brushes and business I, businesses I'd started with with that world, but I hadn't until I studied it. I didn't real really realize what a change it was, and a change again that happened in the 1970s. So and and again, this wasn't just this wasn't you know, the room of five guys and said, oh, you, Wall Street, do this. But the, the, it wasn't a coincidence that it all happened together. And 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 there, as I explained in the book at great length, there are various reasons Wall, what happened to Wall Street happened to Wall Street. But my God, yes. I mean, it was the, the degree to which the financial industry was was just another industry, a service industry that did what it did with banking and raising money for companies that needed to go public or startups and all 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 that it has always did. But it wasn't it wasn't so huge, so grotesquely huge and dominant uh, as it as it became in the last quarter of the twentieth century. And and, and, and I, yes, oh, and oh, and we came to. I was going to say and, what I found. Yeah. yeah. Not after you, please. This is the downside no, of, of say, doing and, this remotely and, and finally, instead of in person. <laughs> and finally, in 2008 and 2009, we, 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 they, that came a cropper and everybody saw it. And, and yet, and yet back then, um, ex, you know, except for the people of the left and the Occupy Wall Street and the Bernie Sanderses and so forth, um, the mainstream um, did not really quite go to the root problems, I think, uh, that, that, that I, I thought, certainly at the time, I thought in 2008, 2009, I wrote a little book about it, that, that this, this, would be, this would be the moment when we sort of sat up straight and started, you know, do, doing right again. And we, learned, we would have learned our lesson by this near-death experience. Well, we didn't at all, really. I mean, we passed some laws, but, but the basic paradigms were not altered at all. But as you say, you mentioned Occupy. I mean, the 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 the, um, the economic left, uh, which which had barely existed in the United States and it, and it wasn't anywhere in the vicinity of power certainly until the two thousands, um, began uh, attracting uh, more and more adherents. And 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 because because what happened in two thousand eight, just you couldn't deny anymore um, the the. The unregula unregulated, self-dealing recklessness that um, so much of the financial industry is about. Yeah, the the thing I was, was going to mention earlier, what I found fascinating from the book was the way the way the nineteen sixties follow your own truth. You know, we all have yeah. our own path to, to follow can be perverted into that means I can pursue profit over everything else, and you know. You, you lead to corporations and ultimately Wall Street going absolutely bananas yeah, yeah. in that sort of exponential way. Um, yes, yeah. I, indeed. And, and I mean, this, I mean, so many, I mean, there are lots of good American traits that in my telling in both Fantasyland and in Evil Geniuses become outsized and, and kind of uh, enlarged and, 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 and out of whack. And individualism is one of those. I mean, in, and we're all individualists, yeah, sure. And 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 what happened, as as you just said, in the late sixties, is this this I do my thing, I, I follow my own bliss, I find my own truth. All those all those things that are so uh, quintessentially late sixties um, didn't weren't just you know after the sixties weren't just for hippies, right? It was it was yeah. it was uh, the Gordon Geckos of the world, uh, and and in anybody and everybody who who wanted to do their own thing, whether it was you know, own 38 AR-15s or, 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 or smoke weed or, or uh, be whatever, um, do whatever they wished in sexual terms, whatever it was, or, or earn billions of dollars in unethical ways that uh, destroy communities. Whatever it is, you're, it's up to you. you. You do your own thing and I'll do my thing and let, let's keep government out of it. Yeah, that was the one quibble I had with you in the book. Did you use earn in situations like that? You know, earn? <laughs> it's not necessarily earning that money, but, oh, but oh, yeah, yes. the, the, the money, the, the money was made. It no, wasn't exactly I, I, earned. It's funny that you say that. I, I really, I, I tried not to use. It's only in a couple I, instances. For exactly <laughs> that reason, I try, I try not to use earn. In the, same, in the same way, I try not to call 
the right, most of the right in America today, conservatives, because, yeah. um, you know, my, my father was a conservative and sir, you are not a conservative. I mean, um, <laughs> and, and so I really, I really avoid using that. I, I, that's why I use the right, uh, because, yeah. um, uh, it, it just, it, it offends my sense of what a conservative is and what conservatives Trust is. Me. Yeah. Early this morning, I was on a Twitter thread back and forth agreeing with a guy from the Cato Institute that yes. a, yeah. a pharmaceutical loan that was just made by by the administration was clearly insanely corrupt. And this guy was like, yeah, no, this is incredibly bad and a sure sign of crony capitalism. I'm like, good. OK, the, the Cato Institute and I are on the same page about something. That's yeah. a good and bad sign. But yes, you know. yes. Well, no, I mean, and it's, it's funny at this moment. The, 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 you know, I always read about the popular front of the, of the 30s and 40s and, and our alliance with the Soviet Union and to defeat Nazi Germany. It is interesting at this moment of politically in America, finding the strange bedfellows uh, one is sharing the bed with uh, in this, in this, at this popular front moment. Yeah. Now, you have a, a a line in the book from I think it's Paul Mason. It might be pronounced Mason. I've, I've no, I think it's Mason. He's a British guy. Okay, okay good. Um, the first person to mention him in a, a podcast of mine was Irvin Welsh, the guy who wrote Train Spotting. Oh, sure, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out he's a big econ guy too. Huh. So go figure. Um, which is actually a, a tremendous episode because I had to stare at his mouth the whole time to, to understand what he was saying. Huh. I don't know how you many didn't Scots have subtitles like we do in his films sometimes. <laughs> I, there was a line that he said that I misheard at the time. And when I edited the episode weeks later, he mentioned a book called the, uh, the bus conductor and both times I thought he said the busking doctor, <laughs> which is a tremendous title for a book, but yes. unfortunately not the book he was referring to. And it so sounds like a Scottish it, book. Yeah. The busking doctors. Yeah, wow, yeah. What a great idea. And then it yeah. took me about three lines. I'm like, Oh, wait a second. The bus can, okay. That that's so anyway. Um, but Paul Mason mentioned that a uh, modern economy cannot coexist with an organized working class. Mm -hmm. And it's been a question for me as to, to how, well, when we started calling them essential workers a few months ago, do you think it's opening a, um, a a good can of worms along those lines. Do you think labor is going to come out of this with a greater sense of its own value? Well, well, I think if labor we has a sense of its own value, but we'll see. I mean, I, you know, I, I do think, uh, again, I'm not without hope. And, and, and then of course the, 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 you, the hatred of police unions, the police, police union suddenly being the unions that everybody knows about and cares about and hates is, is, uh, unfortunate uh, t timing, but I, I, whatever form uh, the reorganization of organized labor takes, unions and otherwise, uh, I, I am hopeful about. It. And I, you know, I, I see a lot of green shoots of of organized labor, whether it's either strikes at a, a number and volume that we've never seen before, just the last couple of years, um, or how the fifteen dollar minimum wage. Uh, which seemed a very few years ago, like, well, that's, that's, that's never going to happen. That's extreme. It, it swept uh, state after state after state. And many cities, of course, that raised it beyond that, that level that their states raised it. So I see, I, I am, I see some hopeful signs. And I, and as you say, with the, with, with this moment and, and the, 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 uh, sufficient and good $600 extras a week for unemployed people and, and so forth. The, the, you know, I think when, once we, once people, citizens suddenly making out and getting by because of the help from the federal government, um, see that, oh yeah, right. The government can do that. And, and, and more generally, once they see, wait, we really need this massive intervention into the mark free market, of the federal government, so that we so that we can uh, survive and and prosper again, um, I, I I can't help but think that it will um, start changing minds. I mean, obviously, you look at polling, and and younger people are already um, you know well ahead of older people in 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 that in that shifting away from the paradigm shift of, of 40 years ago. But I, th I think this is, again, the, I think there are good, in addition to this being the pandemic moment and the response of the administration and the right being a good 
case study of look here's what i'm telling you look look what they've done look how they've 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 ravaged the ability of our society to 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 deal with this terrible problem i, I do think that uh, a lot of people will go yeah this is this is what we're talking about it's not just healthcare of course it is that too that and yeah. and our exceptionally and uniquely terrible system of healthcare in this country but but all of these other ways that that you know yes we're a free market economy, but that doesn't mean that government doesn't isn't essential uh, to 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 creating the guardrails and and taking care of things when 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 the free market doesn't as it doesn't so often. And you know, I, I think I think this will I hope this will be uh, uh, will wake a lot of people up to the fact that you know government is not always bad, and we need government, and 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 it's and and part of the. The success of of our economy and our system in the past, and of of other rich countries' uh, economies now, is this is this this dynamic balance between government and 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 private enterprise. Well, this is it's a lobbying story I've never told on the air before, but uh -oh. I figure at this point no one's listening, so I may as well. <laughs> um, back in seventeen. Um, I was lobbying for this FDA reauthorization bill that had helped negotiate with FDA and industry. And it was this complicated, convoluted thing. But I had to go to a, a number of, of congressional offices to explain why what was in it was in it and why to keep it the way it is and not add anything weird. And um, first, one of the first ones I went to, a uh, pretty high up representative from Texas, his lead healthcare staffer was my my person I was meeting with. And I explained to him, um, 2014, I quit my job, launched this trade association, brought the industry together, got in front of FDA, helped negotiate this new bill. It's really better, an improvement over the previous one. It's going to help this industry, going to help the generic sector overall. And um, and this guy just kept going on about, wow, you, you quit your job and put this association together and you did all this stuff and that that's great, Gil, and we're going to do everything we can to, to, you know, get this bill done, you know, timely manner, no changes, blah, blah, blah. But he kept going on about the, you know, taking a chance thing with me. And when we finished up, I just said to him, he's 26, 27 years old, I huh. said, I know, I know you're working on repeal and replace right now. And I know you're glad to talk with me because I'm not coming in to talk about, you know, that. And this, mm -hmm. so this is early 17. But I said to him, you know, everything you were praising me for, like quitting my job, trade association, all that, I couldn't have done any of that without the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. I said, without that, I couldn't have quit my job, gotten health coverage as an individual in New Jersey totally. and been secure that I could do this over the, the six months it took me to, to build the whole structure, you know, um, charter bylaws, et cetera, before I could start collecting dues and start, you know, getting a stipend from the, the board to pay for my health. Mm -hmm. And he's just turning white. And I just told him like, dude, you just got to keep in mind, you might be killing entrepreneurialism in America by making everybody feel like they have to stick with their employer because they're going to get killed on health coverage otherwise. That, that is such and an important point. That is such an important yeah, point. It turns us all into serfs. Yeah. And, and he was just aghast. And I was like, just telling you, and, and headed out. My, my lobbyist contact, who is Republican, was like, I know you feel strongly about this, Gil, but, uh, you know, ixnay on the ACA stuff. I'm like, I, I only brought it up because he kept praising me for quitting my job. I won't bring yeah. it up again if it's, you know. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I just... make it, and again, I make that point in the book in Evil Geniuses, and and I and I've th it's something I've that again as as somebody who tries to be non doctrinaire about things, that there are many reasons to have some kind of truly universal health care, um, and but a big argument is 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 the entrepreneurial one is this is a free labor economy you're not stuck in this job. Because they're giving you health care and you're not going to get it somewhere. You're, you're, you're going to be able to start a business because your employees are going to be covered by the government in some fashion. It, there is such a – there is a small – there's an old-fashioned conservative argument to me, free enterprise, free market argument for having uh, health care taken off the table as – uh, as, as something that's dependent on your particular job. I mean, it's it's just, right. I, I don't understand why. I mean, I do understand why, but it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so that, that case has not been made enough. It seems to me by people on the left, by Democrats that wait a minute, yeah. it, it will be good for business. And for, as you say, a guy like you, who is going to quit your job and start a new thing. 
ah, that doesn't happen um, if if somebody is going to be not have their medical yeah. expenses taken care of. Yeah, I, I tried Cobra and it was so insanely expensive. So luckily, sure. ACA period came up and it was it was good. But but yeah, there's that sense of of you know people treating things as though well, it's been like this since the you know 40s, 50s, whatever. Therefore, it has to stay like this forever. If the internet era has taught us anything, it's you know disruption is is you know this this almost constant now. Things right. that we thought were and if the last six months have taught us anything. You know, the amount of business travel I used to do, not yeah. huge, but significant. The idea that all that's gone probably till the end of next year, you know, that's yeah. that's not a reality we could have considered even in February when I was on a flight back from Narita, um, the very last trip I, I ever took. Um, you know, everybody I talked to in the industry is like, yeah, we're not going anywhere or doing anything. You know, we're we're meeting virtually, but, you know, the entire way we thought of how business is done and what life is like it can go away instantly. So, yeah. And, and, and again, I mean, as you know, I mean, part, a part of my, my, my attempt to be rousing and hopeful argument in this book is that we, we, we lost the old defining American taste for embracing the new and that kind of like, well, this is a new weird challenge. Let's go for it. And, and again, not to be Panglossian or Pollyanna ish, but out of this terrible moment, could come that 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 we we well, no we didn't have to do it that way we can do it this way, and um and and um yeah I'm I, I'm not without hope I, I I find myself after as 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 eye opening and in some ways in and appalling as some of the things I discovered as I wrote Evil Geniuses were I I find myself more hopeful than I did at the end of Fantasyland because what I wrote about in Fantasyland. It can't really be fixed. It can be. It can be. We we can plant a flag and say no further than this, and 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 yeah. and, and and no QAnon and no. We 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 can try to make it less to. We can try to stop it where it is. Uh, we can't really fix it. I don't think. Whereas this this was again and the point I make and why I spend so much time talking about the seventies and eighties. It it was a different way before. It was changed after it can be changed again and just, you know, and frankly, use the evil geniuses playbook to to be non evil, <laughs> to, to change it back. And that was the not letting a catastrophe go to waste. Yes. line that Cri yeah, not either side can, yeah. can yeah. well which, 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 which both Milton Friedman said a version of in 1982 when when certainly his buddies he and his p comrades on the right didn't let the kind of slight quasi crisis of high inflation and the oil crisis in the 70s go to waste and and what then um, Emmanuel in 2008 said but kind of let it go to waste a bit in that administration yeah. I think um, but yeah because we're too nice well, too That's... nice, and 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 again, not to not to go all Bernie Sanders on you, but like too too, too many too many in the pockets of the people who uh, uh, don't want oh, the yeah. crisis to who do want the crisis to go away, do want to you know stay keep doing business as usual. Yeah, there, there's stories I'll tell you off, Mike, at some point about this stuff. But but a question I, I was sort of wondering, especially by the end of the book. <sighs> What did what does having kids and you've you've got I think two kids I'm not Correct. sure two, two daughters uh, okay yep. um, without going too deeply into private life what did having kids I mean you you, you have a hope for the future but yeah. what have they taught you about you know about limitations on your perspective on this time in terms of learning what what young people are thinking oh, that's um, a very good how, question how people see it that's a very good question they they are fully adults now thirty years old thirty thirty and thirty two. Um, and, and, um, for the last several they're younger years, than me, so they're kids. <laughs> yeah. The, for the last several years, um, um, I have, I have, we have had many spirited conversations about all kinds of things <laughs> and, 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 uh, as they try to educate me and reeducate me, um, um, you know, the, the, one thing, I guess one, th first of all, they have not lived and really no one under 40. Or fifty, practically, has lived in a in a in a in an American economy in which which you know everybody was sharing proportionately, and 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 as the line as the trend lines of productivity and and economic growth went up, 
So did everybody's median wages. That used to be just the normal way of life, but it hasn't been for 40 years. So as a result, you know, and they've been to college and their friends have been to college and they should be, you know, earning plenty and having good jobs and, 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 and amassing wealth, and they aren't. And so uh, I, I guess beyond their, their beliefs about po specific policies, and of course, we don't disagree much about that, really, but this generation uh, who just don't see, I mean, are, 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 are basically not having it anymore. Just like, wait, this isn't working for most of us. It just isn't working for most of us. It, it's, it's like, as I talk in the book about it, it's a musical chairs game where, where, you know, we're not winning we're and, and, and we're not prospering together. And, 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 and they, I think, have helped me realize that. I mean, that's a whole other, uh, and, and, and of course, not of course, but they also were, have been galvanized since um, George Floyd's murder. Um, and, 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 and so they had certainly made sure I was uh, uh, as anti-racist as I could possibly be, even though I'm an old Listen, I feel terrible guy. having you on as a white man. I'm, well, I'm trying to be much more diverse with the show lately. I'm like, oh, God, but I really want to get Kurt on. So, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. No, I as when I was doing my radio show, I often thought like, no, you know, I, I'm the white guy. We don't have to have others very often on my show. I had exactly that uh, <laughs> that um, approach. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've done a terrible job over the year. I, I keep a graph of it and... It was only with BLM that I started looking at non-white guests and, oh, my God, I am I I just deliberately said, OK, let's put a halt there yes. and and start making a concerted effort to get totally. people on who don't look like me. So totally. No. Yeah, and my, yeah. so in, in that sense, not only my own children who are, you know, important in the in my in my process, but but and when I was doing Studio 360, my radio show, the, the young people who uh, and increasingly young, of course, they weren't increasingly young. I was just older and they and they stayed young uh i was mr chips but they they i was gonna go uh, with matthew mcconaughey and dazed and confused but whatever that that's there fine. you go <laughs> okay i'll take that the, but so the, i was helped by them as well but um yeah uh and 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 again as i as i talk about in this book i mean the 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 you know we're all nostalgic about various things either our own childhoods or particular times or or where we grew up or whatever but that can we can fall into a kind of pathological nostalgia, and I think a lot of Americans have done that. And um, you know, uh, there, there's 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 and there, and you can privately wish that it was like it was, and and in some ways it can be like it was. For instance, having a fair economy. But in other ways, I mean, we are we are you know we are no longer an eighty five percent white country. We are now a sixty whatever. Pick your number, 62, 68. And when it came to percent, nostalgia, uh, I was just glad that in the in the book, you basically paraphrased Philip Dick the way I've done for years by saying the 80s never ended, that there's a degree to which we're perpetually trapped in that that decade in in weird ways. Yes, yes, yes. No, I really am struck by that. And, and, and as I say, you know, as I write, it began as kind of a joke, but then it like it it, it was like a Twilight Zone episode or a Philip Dick uh, uh, story like w th th things things used to change <laughs> in in so yeah. many ways so quickly that they really haven't and w why is that and who does that help and how do, why does that happen and and again as I argue it's it's a it's a sort of a strange argument but I think it but I thought about it a lot and I think it's real is it encourages people to think that change big change of any kind. Eh, not possible, not going to happen. Don't worry about it. You know, your, the music is the same. The way the wallpaper looks is the same. And people's hair, you know, people don't dress very differently. And, 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 and again, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> the, the ge evil geniuses aren't that genius, but that, that weird cultural stasis does serve the, the to reinforce that sense that eh, big change just really isn't possible. Nothing really changes that much anymore, except, we now have supercomputers in our pockets, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What was, uh, was there a, a single most shocking thing you came across in the, the course of the book? That's a good question. And I should have a good answer for it. Um, yeah. Someone else is going to ask you who yeah, has exactly. a much bigger audience. There, there, probably. There, there, <laughs> there, are, there were, uh, you know, I, I, I was just shocked over and over again. Cause again, I, I was, it wasn't like 
I went from the memos, being, certainly. What? Yeah. Oh, the memos, certainly. Oh, the me- again, again, these, these, yeah. exactly these memos that uh, starting with the the semi-famous uh, memo by Lewis Powell before he was a Supreme Court justice that really laid this all out in 1971. Um, the the plan to build these think tanks, get the media, have business start, you know, lobbying like crazy and and defending capitalism and all all of it. Um, That wasn't appalling. That was just like, holy cow, this is amazing. I mean, of course, it's if if they hadn't been successful, you know, it wouldn't seem so amazing. And, 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 and in retrospect, once success has happened, you go, look, this, this planned it all, but it, but it did. So no, these, these, these kind of uh, brazenly sinister memos, but I would say, I mean, each thing surprised and shocked me. Like, I mean, it it seemed what uh, antitrust, I knew what it was, but I barely knew what it was until I really did the reading and did the work to figure, to find out what it was. And, and the way that as a specific example of how the, the whole notion of, of what is, what is too big of a co- company and can a company be too big? And if, how do, what do we do? What do we do? And what are the bad effects of a co- of company being too big and powerful? There was one American way of thinking about that. Of course it evolved over the years from 1890 to 1978 and there has been a different way, a, a, an eviscerated, emasculated way since then. So I, I just didn't. I mean, that is as an example of, of, and again, Robert Bork and a few other people, uh, and and who've been working in the in the vineyards of this uh, somewhat boring regulatory law uh, field for years, finally got their way. And and so that I mean, I was amazed by that. I was amazed. I was amazed again and again. So it wasn't uh, as though there was, there was, I didn't, there wasn't a, a, like, that's the most shocking thing. It was, it was the, it was the extraordinary scale and scope and depth of thing after thing, after thing of change, after change of all of these, these uh, uh, different entities and enterprises and associations working uh, in concert in, if not in absolute (laughs) deliberate synchronization, but in, in, in synchrony, you know, to, to get yeah. their way. And, and, and I just, again, so I guess the, the most amazing thing is that after a life of, and writing a book about, and I, I don't believe in conspiracies, they don't really happen. Well, hold on, <laughs> you know, hold my <laughs> beer. Um, they, 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 we, we can take that belief in, in, uh, we can, we can, we can go too far in that, in, in that, uh, uh, um, insistence. Yeah. yeah. The antitrust thing reminded me uh, my literary and bookselling friends who freaked out when the publishers and Apple got smacked down for the, the antitrust issue over yeah. eBooks and, yeah. you know, it should be Amazon that's getting shut down. I'm like, do you understand in America, if your, if your idea was we had secret dinners so we could raise the price of our product for consumers, you'll lose every time. And I'm not saying it's right or not, but when it came to ebooks, Amazon was, you know, setting prices however they wanted. Yeah, ultimately exerting power that, you know, would be damaging to the publishers. But you weren't going to win an antitrust argument about that in, in right. this day and age. Right. You, you, no, exactly. Everything is gauged simply by, you know, whether the consumer was going to see lower prices or not, which. I mean, yeah. another thing that, again, I, I knew the basic headline. Wow. The, the Federalist Society and the right really. uh uh have have effectively taken over a lot of law and jurisprudence in this country. I knew that fact. I had no idea, however, how quick and thorough and by what means that happened. I mean, that that's an example where it really was, you know, there was a memo. We got this is what we got to do, folks. This memo by funded by Richard Mellon Scaife, the right wing billionaire, um, uh, came out in nineteen eighty and said, "Here's what we got to do: A, B, C, D." Uh, uh, get people, you know, right wing, right conservative uh, students out of top law schools. Here's how we had plant them, embed them in the Justice Department. Here's how we do this. Here's how, and kaboom, the Federalist Society is created, and you know, today a, a large fraction, verging on a majority of federal judges, are out of that very little. Uh, that 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 germ that was planted in 1980 has has bloomed into practically a takeover of the federal judiciary. Yeah. 
which I think demographically is all in response to the demographic changes of America is all the right has going for it now, <sighs> which may end up getting me fired in my day job. But, you know, I don't think anybody will listen to this one. So it's, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but, uh, but, but I thought you started ask, it yeah. yourself. You can't get fired, can you? No, no, that's, it's my own trade association. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the companies I represent um, come from all over the spectrum. But, you know, it, my whole thing is diplomacy, basically, you know, yes. just in terms of, you know, I talk to who I have to, but, you know, having goodwill and not screwing people over is sort yeah. of how I, I get by. Do you live in so. Washington? No, no, I'm in northern New Jersey, 25 uh -huh. miles in the city, uh -huh. which raises my question for you. You, I don't know if you're still out, but you, you left New York during the pandemic? Uh -huh. Did you get out? Um, how long have you been out of New York and how has it changed your perspective on the city? I, I, I am at this moment in Northwest Connecticut where we have a little place in the woods where we've been for most of the time. And starting in late May, we started dipping our toe and then legs back into the city um, and have spent quite a bit of time there in the last couple of months for various reasons. Okay. Um, it, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it made me feel more fortunate. I could say privileged that too. Um, it, it made me, um, it also, it's, 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 um, uh, it's, it's, it's so interesting. It's so hard for me now having, you know, four months in, right. So I, I, I used to spend, you know, weekends in the, in the beautiful countryside, but basically I've, I lived in Brooklyn, did, you know, have for, uh, 30 years and lived in New York for 40 years. Um, so it was weird uh, being, it has been weird for me being out of New York city, uh, 90% of my life for the last five months. That is unprecedented in, in, in the last 40 years, you know, I've gone on vacations, I've spent weekends in the country, but so that's that, uh, I don't know yet what that implies for my changed perspective, but it's, it's, it's strange. And, and as when I now go back to New York City and spend days and sometimes a whole week there, I it's hard for me to parse what is weird about everybody wearing masks all the time and nobody going to restaurants and all the rest that we're all experiencing. And how much is just like, wow, I've been living in the country for four months. I'm, 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 I've been ruralized in some way. Um, <laughs> so, so it, it's, it's, it's funny. And, and, um, um, but but you know it it um, I I I have I mean knock wood I'm I'm healthy and alive uh, today and uh, uh, I I you know I feel in in so many ways uh, and and here's a whole new one uh, just staggeringly fortunate. Hmm. Do you remember your first New York moment when you got here after Nebraska after Harvard? I I well I remember actually it was before Harvard when I got. Yeah. to New York. Uh, and I hitchhiked here with a friend in 1971. We hitchhiked from Omaha East to look at colleges hmm. and uh, did along the way and uh, and, and got to New York um, where his uncle, my friend's uncle, Doug Berg's uncle, worked um, um, for the New York Times. Uh, and, and we stayed in his apartment and, and it was, and he had these cool friends. I think, I actually think I, I, I think Roberta Flack was one of his friends, the singer, and she came over <laughs> to his house for dinner. And I don't think that's a dream or a, fa a fantasy of mine. And and uh, so that was my 1971 uh, New York City was that. And I thought, holy cow, you know, I, television and movies had already like set me on the on the my my my, my autopilot for heading toward New York City. But but that that was, you know. Uh, they might as well have been playing Gershwin in the background. I mean, it was it was an amazing New York moment. And then, and then I yeah, I went to college, and and then I don't even remember thinking like, where should I go after college? I, it was I was like a lemming. It was it was it was it was hardwired in my little lemming brain that I of course I was going to New York City, and, and somehow, yeah. you know, as 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 E. B. White so beautifully says in his essay about New York, I was willing to be lucky, and and I. As as all people who move to New York have to be, he says, and uh, yeah. I was very lucky. Yeah, I've, I've perpetually stayed twenty five miles away. I live in the house I grew up in, so wow. you can actually see the New York sky. I know that freaks everyone out. Yeah, I've traveled little. the world and I've done all sorts of crazy <laughs> shit, but yeah, yeah, I've just always stayed here. But when you and get are to your this, parents uh, in the attic? No, I'm sorry. Well, uh, probably no, they, they, I, I wish. my father. No, it's okay. My father lives about ten miles away. There's oh, a convoluted oh. story behind that, but. Uh, oh. 
but when you try and leave uh when you leave town there's a, you go over skyline drive as it's known and you can see about three quarters of the new york city skyline from huh. the, the top as you're huh. going over the road so that has been my perpetual new york always at a distance uh, and again during the before time i would go in all the time to do uh to record these and, and sure. do other stuff but sure. but yeah i've always had the close close enough that's fine you know yeah. I, I don't need to you know learn to, to be lucky or be willing to be lucky yeah um, but my my question as a guy who's been doing this for eight years myself um what did you learn over 20 years of studio 360 which shut down in february I very think. good yes indeed um, the end of february yeah. the literally the yeah. moment before the pandemic um yeah. which again in, in a different way makes me think like i'm 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 magical and or cursed or yeah. prophetic or something like, yes, let's end the show because the next day <laughs> a pandemic will begin. Um, but <laughs> what, did I, what did I learn? Um, I learned a lot of things. I, I sucked at it at the beginning. And um, mm -hmm. I guess I learned uh, to shut up and let people talk. Certainly, I learned that. Um, I, I learned. I learned this thing. I, I, I'm. He, I was hesitant to say it to my coworker because I thought they'd think I was creepy, and and so I didn't. Um, but um, uh, but now I don't have the job, so I can. Uh, I, I realized that uh, creating rapport with a guest is is key, and and what it amounts to uh, to do it well, I, I realized is is like every interview with a new guest is like a first date and the yes, last date. Yes, totally. You know, you're, <laughs> I've you're never not going to have another date. That, but it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to yeah. have another date. And so that's good. You don't have to worry about it. But like, this is a first date and you really want to make a good impression. You want them to like you. You want to like them. You want it to go well. So, so uh, I learned that. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I guess I learned that... Um, well, as I had when I was a journalist uh, before I started writing fiction and in, in, in books, when I was a, a full time journalist, I realized that m native curiosity, genuine curiosity, you know, it, it can be can be monetized, it can be useful, can be is is yeah. the key important thing in jobs like this. Is is are you interested in talking to people about what they do? And and I before I ever did this, and I you know came to it late in life, relatively speaking, um, I, 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 I mean, I, I am easily bored by boring people, but I would find myself at dinner parties or whatever. And, 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 and really interested in talking to the people, I, a person I would meet about whatever it was they're doing and what they could tell me and what I could learn from them. So that, you know, I learned that, that, that thing that was just sort of second nature and unconscious could be, uh, uh, channeled okay. into, you know, doing e interviews decently. And, and then, you know, the, the, the performative aspect of, of doing this, you know, I, I'm being myself. I'm talking as I talk to you, if you were having a drink with me here, but certainly when, when one is a host of a thing and in radio, uh, and by the way, you have a, I'm, I'm surprised you've only been doing this six years. You sound like you, like you know, you went to professional broadcaster school, but anyway, <laughs> um, um, I, I realized that that there's a there's a way in which it is both you and a performance of you. It is one and a performance of one, and and uh, and and trying to keep it from being too performative, but 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 mostly not getting so just the raw you that you are speaking in sentences that don't make sense and last forever sure. and, and digress in weird ways as in real life mine do. Um, so that, that, you know, you learn that, um, uh, I don't know, uh, what else I learned. Um, um, that's, that's, <laughs> that's about the extent of it. Yeah. That, that's something for 20 years. That's pretty yeah. good. You know, yeah. the, the shut up and listen is still that, that was the one that was, Oh, if I just and, and the uh, the remote sessions like this, it's really necessary. And I had the one I did with Benjamin Taylor. I just had to. I don't know this guy, but I'm not going to say anything right now because yeah. I think the silence is about to unfold. It and oh, good, it did. You know. Yeah, and it's um, it's hard. But, it's it's hard doing it. I mean, you know, famously Terry Gross does. I think all or certainly almost. Yeah, all she only does it this I was on her show remotely, and she's not with you. Um, and it's 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 a. It's a 
it's it's doable certainly and this has been a fun conversation if you know 100 miles apart but um it, it is it is the the lack of body language and cues and everything else can you know makes it trickier it makes that like first date rapport creating thing harder um yeah. certainly and um uh I, I the one thing i learned when when one is in a studio with somebody i learned it when i was interviewed before i had that job or maybe when i first got the job i probably you know it was it was when i was promoting a book so it was right around the time i got the job anyway i was i was in uh, london and promoting a book and and uh this bbc interviewer um uh as i was talking um would do this weird thing. He would just nod at me as I was talking to like, go on, go on, as if to say, go on, go on, mm -hmm. or yeah, or whatever. Because one's natural conversational, you're having a conversation. So you say, oh, uh-huh, yeah, right, uh-huh. And and of course, that's annoying, uh, or can be annoying if you hear it uh, on a, on radio. And so that, I, there was a, that was weird to me, just to start nodding at, at people, but it does the trick, you know? Yeah. And that's, again, doing the remotes like this. For the first two plus months, I did daily shows with past guests because uh -huh. we were all going through pandemic craziness. So I just, yeah. uh, early on, I would literally record it, turn around, do an intro and post it like an hour later. Eventually, I, I slowed down a little, but it was 60 of those from the end of March to early June. Good God, man. Just, Oh, it listen, we all dealt in our own ways. <laughs> to yeah. me, this is this is my therapy a little yeah. bit, you know, not in a way yeah. that I have to unload, but but yeah, just everybody needed those conversations. The guest did, I did, you know, the it turns out the listeners started writing like, "Yeah, you might be burning yourself out doing seven of these a week, so maybe cool down a little bit, but you know, not too much cuz I I I rely on these. I'm like, yeah. okay, that's 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 great. That's good for somebody. Yeah. I ended when I did a, a cartoonist from New Zealand the day after New Zealand went to zero uh, right. COVID cases. Because yeah. after that, I, I had a few new ones coming. And then I thought, there really isn't a reason anymore. Dylan already got to, to zero cases in, in New Zealand and Auckland. And I, I, you know, let's let's think ourselves past this this first phase of the pandemic. And that's when I went to guess I hadn't recorded with previously. But the question that <laughs> that I have to ask, who did you miss out on that you regret? Um, well, there were a bunch. Um, I was always sorry that uh, we couldn't get Tina Fey to come on for whatever set of reasons. I re I, I'm a great admirer of her. I would have liked to talk to her. Uh, Steve Martin uh, is another person there. So they're not all Saturday Night Live associated people, but I guess in those two cases they were. And I know Steve Martin a bit, and so I, I was particularly um, unhappy that I didn't get to talk to him. Um, who else? Uh, you know, J.D. Salinger. I think he was still alive when I was doing the show, maybe. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think but, he was like um, 2005 or six. So, yeah. yeah, so he was. I could have. <laughs> if if he'd gone anywhere, he would have come to my show. Um, yeah. uh, I say that about Pynchon, you know. <laughs> well, you know, and the thing about Thomas Pynchon is yeah, he, he would be one I would obviously love. The thing is, unlike Salinger, who made this, his, who did his recluse thing in his prickly, recluse yeah. way, Thomas Pynchon, by all appearances, you know, like appearing on The Simpsons, for instance, um, isn't like a prickly Salinger-esque guy at all. He just d doesn't do this, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. he's he's. I I I think he'd be great. I I I I mean, I admired his writing, of course, but uh, I I I I like him because he he doesn't seem, you know, I don't know, to make a jerky fetish of it like J.D. Salinger did. Yeah. I could be wrong about that, right. but it doesn't seem like he does. Yeah, no, my, I, I have a story of a guest who grew up with Matt Groening uh -huh. and when, when they were recording and the two of them were huge pension fans when they were kids, Richard Gare is the, uh, the, the guest, uh, when Groening was going to record with pension or uh, have pension record for the Simpsons, he called Richard and said, uh, so yeah, we got a uh, Thomas pension coming into the studio in New York. Do you want to come in today? He's like, well, yeah, Matt, that would sort of be the thing because you and I read Gravity's Rainbow to each other as teenagers. <laughs> so race is there. The punchline of it all is while Matt and Richard are, are geeking out over Thomas Pynchon, Pynchon's son is there and he's geeking out over Matt Groening because The Simpsons. He doesn't oh, care. Right. His dad is, right. is Thomas Pynchon. It's, oh my God, you're the Simpsons guy. And that was, you know... <laughs> So yeah, we've all got our, our... Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, mostly, I, I, I mean, 
it's going to sound corny, but I, I don't, I, I, I do, I am not burdened with a lot of regrets in life, uh, mm-hmm. partly because I've been so lucky, but including in the like, oh, I wish I'd had her. I wish, I wish I'd had him. Rather, like, wow, I got to spend an hour and a half with Susan Sontag, or wow, you know, the, the, so I, the, those, the, the good things, that the got things that I got to do, uh, uh, be, talk to my heroes, uh, um, be impertinent with people I never could have in any other circumstance, uh, sort of blot out the, yeah, but I never got, you know, um, yeah. Mick Jagger on. I mean, I got, you know, my, one, one of my great pop musical heroes, David Byrne on twice, maybe three times. So, you know, nice. I, I was on a plane with him to Toronto from Newark, and I thought, I better not pitch him now because we're on a plane. I'll wait till we land, <laughs> yeah, not thinking yeah. that they were going to hustle him off the plane immediately and get him out of all contact, yeah. which is why when I bumped into Graydon Carter years later in Ottawa, I um, I just – ever since the David Byrne thing, I will go up to whoever and just give them my pitch, explain who I am, what I do, et cetera. Uh, so when I bumped into Graydon um, – I was luckily in a suit and all that because I was up in Ottawa for work. Um, I have just immediately went into pitch mode, explained what I do, et cetera, but didn't get him, but got one of his uh, uh, friends from, from Vanity Fair. He, I guess, was just leaving. Uh, so this would have been end of 17. Yeah. So uh, that, that makes sense. And he doesn't yeah. really like doing this stuff. He doesn't like. No, that's what I, being I also interviewed. got that vibe too. Yeah. 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 He was more like, oh, there are people I should connect you with. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. not pushy about it, but, uh, you know, I've, I've had the bumping into Spike Lee on the train and thinking, well, we've got another two hours before we get to Washington. So I'm not going to be too pushy about it because I don't right. know what I'm feeling uncomfortable. Right. Right. But, you know, eh, you know, um, the question that has been plaguing me, though, about doing this and that I know, you know, you've got the same situation with and I'm wondering how you're adjusting to it. Reading when you no longer have to read books for upcoming guests. Because mm-hmm. for me, a lot of what I read is still totally. for guests. Totally. And yeah, sometimes I get ahead and I can I can read on my own for extracurricular stuff. Um, now that you don't have a show, are you are you enjoying just being able to, to read for that's that's a it's a great joy? question and I haven't entirely adjusted to it, to tell you the truth. Because uh, I, 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 and certainly as I was writing uh, Evil Geniuses, and I was still writing the last chapter in May. I, I so so I couldn't either, tell if it finished in June or May. That's yeah. So I was, <laughs> from, so, from the timeline of the the final chapter. But exactly. Yeah, sorry, so I was so I was both, um, you know, as you say, reading my my reading was heavily, you know, a majority of it was for people I was going to interview on the show, and then and then for the last two and a half years, three years for this book as well. So I haven't yet adjusted to like, wow, I can, I can just read anything. And then there's the course, there, there's the other thing of, you know, well, I have a lot of friends who are writers and, and I, and I want to read their books too. So, but, and now I get to read more of, I am reading more of those, which is delightful and wonderful. Um, but it's, it's, um, I haven't yet adjusted to, wow, I can just pick anything to read that I want to read. Uh, I haven't, I have, I haven't fully adjusted to that new reality yet. It's still summer. There's time for beach reading, as, as it were. Although that raises an idea or a notion I hadn't even thought about. Did you have to deal with, uh, God, friends of yours who kind of hoped they were going to get on Studio 360? Was that ever a sure, sure? You know, I have to talk to my producer, or no, did, did that create no, any tension? I mean, uh, I, 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 I probably said that once or twice, but. Uh, 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 it not, it wasn't, it was never really problematic. And, and, uh, and I was happy to, you know, in, in, when I did that, when I, when I interviewed friends of mine who had books or in some cases, uh, a movie, uh, it was, it was fine. I mean, it, I had, that was a thing I had to learn actually, not that it, it happened all that often, but it happened often enough that I had to, it's weird. You have to learn to talk to, to your friend, not as, as though they're not your friend. So it's, it's, it's some strange obverse or converse of the first date idea. It's like, no, we can't, we're not going to pretend we don't know each other, but we're not going to talk. It'll get too insidey feeling if we talk as we would talk yeah. normally, do you know? So, you so can't that do was, the shorthand, certainly. It, yeah. No, no. And, and, uh, that was, that, that, that's tricky, but, um, but it wasn't, it was never problematic. Uh, did- and, and, um, no, I, 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 I was, I, I am a pretty, I'm a fairly straightforward person and I, I try to be kind, but I, I'm also fairly straightforward. And so 
you know, I, 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 I would say, uh, well, well, first of all, I would say if, if they had written a book about, I don't know, civil war, I would say, this is an arts and culture and entertainment show. Sorry, we don't do that. Uh, so that was easy, easier. Um, oh, and, and, um, and sometimes, and it was not a lie. It was, uh, well, you know, maybe I'd love it. Let me, let me talk to my producers. And then if, if my producers were up for it and excited about it, um, I, I, you know, great. Um, and, and, and sometimes I would Bigfoot and 900 pound gorilla them and say, no, we're having her on. Um, but, uh, not very often. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's what I'd wondered more about the not having them on and whether that screwed things up or, you know, created any sort of tension, but I imagine the Nebraska upbringing and, you know, years in, in the New York media culture enables you to, to, or enabled you to negotiate those, those uh, pretty situations well, pretty, pretty well, smoothly. Pretty well, pretty well. Or, and for all I know, there are dozens of friends of mine who are, have been seething for years that I didn't put them on the radio <laughs> show. So I don't know. They'll start their own podcast. You'll see. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess it's, well, sort of the last question, which can be an open-ended one in terms of what you're working on next, but form you enjoy the most in terms of long-form nonfiction, novels, journalism, interviews? Well, that's, uh, I, 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 yeah. I, Having um, in the last, uh, well, I finished Fantasy Land and then I wrote this fiction with Alec Baldwin, this fictional Trump memoir in, in <laughs> as, as faster than I've ever written a book in my life. And then, and so that was a nice dip back into f fiction. Uh, but having spent, you know, two years writing Fantasyland and now two years writing um, uh, Evil Geniuses, I, I, I feel like I'm pining for, uh, to write a novel, which is going to be my next book. Um, so, um, I, I, I wouldn't say, it. and novels are my favorite thing to do, but I do really like writing novels. And, 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 uh, and of course I say that it's, it's like having children, not that I ever gave birth, of course, but it's like, yes, you love your children. You loved having them. But you forget then once you get pregnant again, what a miserable <laughs> horror it is to be in the middle of a book. You don't know where, how, when you're going to finish, how you're going to finish, how you're going to get there. However, that said, because I haven't, except for the Trump book, which I love very much, in terms of my own novel, I haven't, you know, it's been uh, almost, it's been eight years since I last published a novel. So I'm eager to do that again. Mm -hmm. Um but but I also like and 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 my life when I was doing the radio show for twenty years was divided really blissfully between the, spending eight a.m. to one p.m. every day uh, writing and then having lunch and most days uh, of the week going into the office and collaborating and making a radio with these smart great talented people that was wonderful so I do I I, I don't. I don't require collaboration like I do require to write. I mean, it's not as essential to me, but I really like it. And and there are certain things like making TV shows, for instance, or anything really, but writing books. Or I guess I guess you don't necessarily have to collaborate on a podcast. But I I, I do like I, I am involved in a couple of projects now that are collaborative, and and one is a podcast actually, and one's a TV show, and and uh, they're fun, and they're and they're not full time, and they're, but they're they're things I'm doing and and excited about. So um, it's it's I, I so uh, I guess the essential thing that I could never and would never until I was unable give up is is writing books, and 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 right now having not written. Uh, a, a a full length novel quad novel for a few years. Uh, that is is what I'm just itching, eager, delighting at the prospect of doing. Um, but again, my 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 career, such as it is, has been always uh, being willing to and eager to do that other thing too, and do this other thing on the side. Do you know? I, 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 and sometimes I was spinning too many plates at once, but there, for me, there's an optimal number. There's a, there's a main plate to spin and then, you know, one or two others on the side. Um, because, you know, I, I, they, they, they gratify different parts of, of me. Actually, well, one more question on, on top of that, because it ties into the time I met Graydon in, in Ottawa. Um, he was just leaving Vanity Fair, as, as I said, and, um, 
it occurred to me that he was about to go through something that I went through in 2014 when I left trade magazines, which I'd been doing since 1995 to launch the, the trade association, which was I moved into a new role where there wasn't something coming out periodically. Uh -huh. There wasn't a thing yeah. that was being produced. And I emailed him afterwards and said, listen, I know this is incredibly presumptuous and blah, blah, blah. But this, I think, is the first time for you in decades that you're not going to have like a production deadline or yeah. anything. And you might find that weird. He never wrote back and I didn't expect him to. But uh -huh. I don't know for you also, you, you went from role to role. Did you ever have an extended stretch where there wasn't a a real deadline and a fixed, you know, no, set of things coming no, out? No, no, there is, hasn't been. And, uh, but there's, it's you know, weird. I mean, a deadline two years from now is still a deadline for me. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it sounds crazy, but in a, a deadline in a week, a deadline in a month, a deadline in six months, a deadline in two years, it's all a deadline. And once I have it, I'm, I'm, I'm locked in like a laser on that, you know? So, okay. so, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. I gotta say not to have a weekly deadline right now. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll miss it, but I, but at one point I was writing a regular column for uh, New York magazine and doing the radio show and writing books. And, uh, <clears throat> that was <laughs> that I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was burdened by deadlines. So I, I don't know. I don't miss that. And, and now we have the wonderful unpaid uh, content creation um, uh, vehicle called Twitter. And, and if, if I need to <laughs> have the, the feeling of having, of publishing something regularly, I can just go write a tweet. True. And that was uh, what I realized Graydon and I both did the same thing, which was I created a weekly e-newsletter for my trade association exactly. so that I would exactly. keep putting something out and he created airmail. So exactly. uh, it looks like we just can't get away from this stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, I, I am. I mean, I, yeah, no, I, 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 I edited a weekly magazine, New York magazine, and I, that was great, but, but, and it was great. And I, but I realized that my, my ideal frequency. I mean, we're all like horses or something who have, you know, are we plow horses? Are we dancing horses? Are we race horses? Whatever. And I don't know what I am in the horse uh, trope, but uh, I weekly and daily, weekly I could do daily. Never. I really couldn't and don't want to, even though I've also done that uh, as journalists. Uh, I, I, I like having a little time, you know, to, to uh, figure things out. Um, so here I here I am, and 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 again, I I'm, it may be, uh, it, it's funny. I, I I don't it doesn't, and and I real I realize I don't need it to be regular, uh, weekly, monthly. As again, I, I have another book, and I have a contract for another book, and I have these other two things that will have their own deadlines. This podcast, this TV show, that's fine with me. I I I, 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 I it gives enough external structure to my uh, work life. True. And we all have enough anxiety every single day at this point. So you don't need that to fuel you, I guess. No, exactly. No. Well, yeah. and then, I mean, you know, imagine speaking of anxiety, there's, there's that, well, there's mortality in general, yeah. there's pandemic uh, in particular. And of course oh. there's the president, the president of the United States, who of course- That's the anxiety I meant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I thought you were talking about the pandemic. Yeah. Good. No, exactly. Yeah. It, I mean, it's just so weird that this stranger is in my head every hour. And in fact, just yesterday I had this odd, uh, I said to my wife, you know, I don't think I've thought about him today. I don't think I've thought about him today yet. I said at lunch, which meant like, wow, I'd gone four hours without, without thinking about Donald Trump. <laughs> um, and, and just how, how, what a weird- you know, it's it is like a like a parasite in in the in in one's soul, uh, and someday we'll be free of it. I can only hope. To me, if I had that reaction of not thinking of him for four hours, I would wonder if there was like a carbon monoxide leak in my house or something. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> so we're yeah. not going to jinx anything about November. We're we're not gonna we're not gonna nope. offer up any jinxes about nope. this stuff. But no. Nope. But did the book leave you hopeful? You know, you, uh, you mentioned book, that sense. This book yeah. kind of did. I, I really, it, 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 uh, I mean, it, 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 I, I really saw how ugly and unfortunate, uh, we, we remade our system was remade to be and how unnecessarily, I mean, as I did in fancy, I had a whole chapter in fancy land about like 
I'm, I'm talking about the United States, but let me spend this chapter comparing us in these ways to the rest of this civilized, quote unquote, developed rich world. Did the same thing with evil geniuses. And, and so here are all these models of countries <laughs> where people are as rich as we are and a lot happier than we are and, and, and a lot more content and a lot more fair and, and not screwing themselves over in this pandemic. And like, wow, it can be done. So, and as I say, it was, it was, it wasn't, it, this, it was changed in 1980 and thereabouts. Mm -hmm. So theoretically it can be changed back. And I, and I do see, I do see green shoots of hope here and there. Um, you know, uh, may, maybe or maybe not we'll get to the promised land in my lifetime, but um, uh, I, I do, I do, I, I am, I am not without hope. I mean, it's 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 fifty point four percent hope. Uh, so it's 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 the glass not half full, but barely just over half full. You know, um, but yeah, I, I I came away from this with I mean the, the hope uh, that I express at the end of the book is not fake. I mean, it's funny. Uh, I got a nice review from a British guy who, being British, just couldn't quite buy that I ended on a hopeful note. But but um, <laughs> but uh, but it's you know I am who I am and I'm an American and there you go. That said, I mean you know if it goes wrong on November third, uh, talk to me again. I may be entirely I, at that moment. Uh, if, if if November fourth is bad or or January eighteenth or whenever we finally have mm. a transition of power. And we know who won the election. Uh, I'll, I'll be well. I'll be I'll be a new man. That is to say, a hopeless man. If uh, if that happened, we'll hope for better results. And I, I hope you and I can talk again. I would, that would be great. It's yeah. a pleasure talking to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kurt. My my total pleasure. You, you're really good at this. I I, I it was, this was great. Thank you. And that was Kurt Anderson. His new book is Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, A Recent History, from Random House. You can find it at bookstores everywhere. I can't recommend it highly enough, uh, especially when you pair it with Kurt's previous book, Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. As he lays it out, unless you understand what's at the root of America's problems, you can't begin to fix them. Uh, I should also note that I uh, enjoyed Kurt's first two novels, Turn of the Century and Heyday, and I have True Believers on my shelf. Keep meaning to start it. Never have. Uh, I was hoping he wasn't going to ask me about it. Now, Kurt's website is KurtAnderson.com, which is K-U-R-T-A-N-D-E-R-S-E-N.com not S-O-N. Uh, that's got links to some of his journalism, his appearances and press all of his books and his work on Spy Magazine, as well as lots of links to his great work as host of Studio 360. You should also follow Kurt on Twitter as KB Anderson and Instagram as Kurt B. Anderson, all one word. And there'll be links to all that in the show notes for this one. Now, in the before time, this is when I would ask you guys to show me some financial support through Patreon or PayPal. I'm not going to do that. Uh, my job takes care of me pretty well. My expenses are way down for the podcast because I don't drive anywhere or, or do anything. Um, so what I'm asking for is eh, an occasional letter, email, postcard, whatever, um, to tell me what you like and don't like about the show. And um, more importantly, I want you, if you have any money to spare, to help other people. Uh, give to individuals, go to their Kickstarters, Patreons, Indiegogos, GoFundMes, whatever, um, and help artists, writers, non-artists and writers, just people in need. If you're not comfortable giving to individuals, there are plenty of institutions that can use your help right now. Uh, food banks, freedom funds, and the like. Um, a lot of what we talk about in terms of what America is going through um, in this conversation, I mean, there are uh, things you can do to, to try to help. Now, um, as far as what I do for the supporters of the show, uh, I do still have a few dozen copies left of the very first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. Um, if you want one, they're free. Just drop me a line uh, or visit Haiku for Business Travelers dot com and you can hit me up that way. Um, like I say, free. You can send me a few bucks for postage and production if you want, but it's not a money making thing. It's 
It's just me sharing my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 